Welcome everybody as you join in to our webinar today. We will be getting started in the next minute or two. I want to give a chance for everyone to be able to log in. Looks like we have a fair amount of people joined in. So I'm just going to give it another minute um, to make sure that I don't have any issues. Uh, looks like we're having much more success than last week when we had a couple of uh, technological difficulties. But it uh, looks like we have a really great group um, joining in today. So just give it um, another minute and then we'll get started with Julia. Okay. So welcome everyone. We are excited to have you here um, and excited to have Julia. Um, just as a reminder, your video and audio have been disabled as attendees um, to help kind of facilitate this conversation a little bit more easily. Uh, please use the chat feature as we move through the conversation to share and also use our Q&A feature to ask questions directly. And Julie and I will do our best to answer them throughout our conversation. Uh, as we have in the past, anyone asking questions in the chat is gonna be eligible to receive a Focus Mean intern prize pack with some fun summer swag. So uh, I don't have them to show off today, um, but we have them, they're being shipped out soon. So we'll have them to show you on future calls. Um, but back to today, uh, today we're gonna be focusing on leadership skills and development through the lens of nonprofits and community organizations. We're thrilled to have Julia Layton with us today and I'm personally excited to host this conversation. This topic is really close to my heart and one in which Julia and I immediately connected when we first met virtually about a month ago. Um, I've been involved in nonprofits and community outreach throughout my career and while it started as a personal passion to give back in recent years I've certainly come to understand just how important it was to my growth and career development. Um, I've worked with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society through their Woman of the Year campaign. Um, I'm currently involved with Rotary International. Um, locally, I've done some more work with the Maine Cancer Foundation and Heart of Biddeford, um, and now work at a nonprofit, Educate Maine. Um, I've truly benefited from the opportunities I've had to grow professionally in these roles and organizations through responsibilities and projects I wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. Um, and finding ways to stretch yourself, especially early in your career, is one way that you can really jumpstart yourself um, and have clear examples to speak to as you talk to future employers or look for promotions or new opportunities within your organizations. Um, I am delighted to introduce you to Julia Layton, who has done all of that and more, including starting her own nonprofit, um, and look forward to hearing from her um, on how her career leadership in nonprofit have evolved over the years. Uh, Julia is the founder of Let's Diabet This, an annual cornhole tournament to raise money for the American Diabetes Association in memory of South Portland graduate Matt Foster. Community involvement has been an important piece of Julia's personal and professional career, and she has worked with many nonprofits, including Propel Portland, Jobs for Maine Graduates, United Way, and the American Cancer Society. Julia is a Maine native and believes that Maine is hands down the best place to work and live, which we love. Um, she started her career in sales and has worked at a number of Maine-based businesses, including mainly Tubbs and IDEX. She quickly made the jump to business development and has excelled at networking, a key aspect to success in both sales and fundraising, which has served her well. Julia is currently a membership development associate at Evergreen Credit Union. And with that, welcome, Julia. Thank you so much for having me, I'm excited. 
Wonderful. Um, so uh, I think we'll we'll jump right in, and as we do that, maybe um, our attendees can put in the chat um, where they go to school and if they're interning, where they're interning. So Julia has an idea of kind of who's on the call and um, and and where you're from. Um, so just kind of jumping right in, Julia, you started this group or, or this. Uh, nonprofit this tournament um, let's die beat this in 2016 so tell us a little bit about the organization and how it got started all right thank you so let's die beat this like you said it was established in 2016 uh, one of my dear friends uh, grew up with diabetes um, you know he's had it since he was young so we always were familiar with it and he passed away in the summer of 2016. Although it was not directly related to diabetes, I you know, felt empowered to do something in his honor. Um, nonprofits, fundraising, that is what I know, that's what I'm passionate about. Um, and you know, Cornhole was sort of a new thing and I had a few people tell me, you're not gonna get people to sign up for that, people aren't gonna come out. And my first year, I had about 40 teams come out and probably 30 to 40 spectators. So that was huge. Um, after that first year, we just kept going. You know, it's, it's a once a year. I hope to expand and do a couple different things. Um, you know, I'd love to do a skydiving event that's hopefully to come in the next couple years, a little bit more uh, dedication to detail for that. But I just you know, I wanted to do a cornhole tournament. I put out the invitation on Facebook, and as soon as people started signing up, I said, okay, I gotta get a raffle table and I'm gonna get a venue. And then the rest kind of just started falling into place. That's fantastic. So as you were getting started, I'm sure that you questioned a lot of different things. Um, and kind of what were the most important skills that helped you be successful getting this, getting this off the ground? You know, I think one of the most important things was knowing I could ask for help, you know, reaching out to people to say, hey, can you bring a cornhole board? I don't have enough. Or, you know, would you please donate a basket, um, a themed basket? People would respond and say, well, you know, what's a themed basket? I'd say uh, a basket of dog toys, a basket of coffee mugs and coffee, you know, kind of telling them almost exactly what I needed mm -hmm. and people just, you know, came full force and they donated, they came, they, they brought the cornhole boards, they brought the bags and, you know, just leaning on my community and the friends and family that I had was huge to help me be successful, especially in that first year. That's great. So, and so now it's been going for almost four years. Were you able to do it this summer? Um, so actually, it's it's a cornhole tournament I hold every second Sunday in October. Okay. Um, so this year we might not be able to do it, especially with everything going on. I'd hate to be the reason of a big outbreak, you know, sure. where I'm having about a hundred people come out. Um, so what I'm thinking this year is I'm gonna, I, I'm possibly just going to put together a calendar and do a different raffle every day and let people, you know, buy into the raffle and each day there'll be a winner of something. So uh, I'm still going to do something to raise the money. It just probably won't be a physical in-person event. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the good news is that if it is something that isn't uh, in person and it's more virtual, it will be easier for us to share among this community um, and we'll be happy to do that for you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that's kind of one aspect of your life. You're also involved in other nonprofits, which we're going to get to, but right now you're working um, at Evergreen Credit Union. Can you just share a little bit about what your job is there and a little bit about Ever Evergreen? Yeah, so Evergreen is a credit union right here in South Portland, Maine. Um, we've got three other branches, um, Naples, Portland, and Wyndham. Um, we were established at S.D. Warner, um, you know, the mill in Westbrook, I believe 1959, don't quote me, I apologize. Um, but you know, it, it started as a small business credit union and it started to grow. Um, and 
my job here is member development, as you mentioned. So what I'm doing is I'm working with local dealerships to partner with them to help them with loan applications and getting you know people approved for the vehicles, boats, RVs, um, all that fun stuff. We also have a program called ECU at Work that I'm a part of. ECU at Work goes into local businesses at no cost and we do lunch and learns. They're usually about 25 minutes long and each lunch and learn is dedicated to a different financial topic. Um, and then we do free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling for the members as well. So my day is all about, you know, networking and communication and bringing people together and really still just helping as many people as I can. That's great. Thank you. So do you um, do the membership, like the outreach to potential businesses that might be interested in having one of those lunch and learns and, and that is that kind of your role as the outreach part? Yep, absolutely. So, you know, I'm constantly looking at, you know, best businesses, local businesses, um, buy local seeing who's on their, you know, business list. I'm always looking for different business lists to reach out and say, hey, this is a free service we offer. You know, it really helps to benefit their staff. Um, people who are financially stable, they do better in the workplace. They're happier. You know, they're, they're more apt to just thrive in the workplace. You know, you're not stressed with financial burdens and all of that. So you know, managers and, and owners love for us to come out and sit down and usually once we show up once, they schedule us back within a month or two or the next quarter to hit another topic. You know, it's, it's really helpful to these business owners and the, the staff. That's great. Um, do you ever work with college students at all? We haven't yet. Um, that is something that, you know, has been discussed and I'd love to get involved with universities and colleges. We've done, we've gone to middle schools, we've gone to high schools, you know, we've created this budgeting game where you roll the dice and all of a sudden you've got a $500 car payment or, you know, a car accident and you have to figure it all out within your budget. It's, it's really fun to see the kids' reactions, um, but I think it would be awesome to get out there and see if we, what we can do with a college student. Excellent. So in your role um, and the work that you're doing, what is the most important skill or the, or the top few skills that are important for your success at the credit union? Absolutely. Um, you know, communication is the biggest. You, we work with so many different people and we do, you know, set foot in each department. We work a little bit with the loan team. We work with the marketing team. Um, you know, we're, it's, Communication is huge. Um, and then networking, of course. Being able to network, go out to events, meet business owners, um, or even employees that I can chat with that have connections. You know, I went out to um, the Brewers Guild a few months back, or quite a few months back now, and um, I met quite a few people who showed up as vendors, and we talked about ECU at work and coming out at no cost and working on these um, financial lunch and learns and we got a few people who were really interested in having us come out. So networking is huge, but again, communication is, is such a large piece of it. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to throw you a curveball question here. So you brought up networking. Um, yep. Networking can be a really scary term, especially if you're early in your career. Um, you're not sure that you have something to offer, right? I mean, I've know I've heard a lot of times, you know, networking is about like finding someone that you can have that give and take relationship with. Um, it's, you know, what is networking for you and what advice would you give to students when we're saying like networking is, is an important skill, you know, you need to learn how to network. What, what would be the, the thing that you would tell students about networking, knowing your mm -hmm. background? So the funny thing about me is I've always loved to network. It's, it's kind of my natural ability. Uh, I was going to the Cumberland Club in Portland when I was 17 years old with CEOs and VPs and, and all these people. And to me, you're just having a conversation with somebody. And these people, they want to have a conversation with you. You might only be able to say, you know, I graduated from high school, I volunteered a few times, and now I'm at this college. But then they're going to ask, well, what are you going to school for? What do you want to do? 
And that right there is a connection. They personally might not be able to help you, but they're, they're going to say, hey, I had a great conversation with this person. They're going to talk to somebody that they know, mm -hmm. and that itself is networking because now the person they know can connect with you, and they're going to be able to help you, you know, thrive in your career or just move forward with whatever it is you need. Um, and networking doesn't always have to be with potential um, business partners. You know, if, if I'm out to eat and there's a couple next to me, I'm going to chat with them. And next thing you know, you're networking and they're like, hey, I own this design company. Let me help you with your, your nonprofit. Um, <laughs> you know, let me design some things for you. So it, it, it doesn't have to be scary. It really is just a conversation. And the more conversations you have, the easier it's going to get. Great. Thank you. So getting back to the nonprofit side, you kind of started to take us there. You've been involved in some other nonprofits. Um, and how, like throughout your career, what drives that for you and how, and how have you been involved with them? There's tons of ways to get involved with a nonprofit. Absolutely. So for me, it start, I started young. Um, my mother worked for a company local in South Portland and they were big on, you know, walks around the Portland Boulevard. Um, whether it was for heart disease or a breast cancer walk, whatever it was, I was going. I was young, but it was cool. You know, the survivors have different shirts on. You can visually see who these people are. You can see who's impacted. And, you know, when speakers come up and all these things of how we're helping just by being there and being together, I mean, that is something that really started to drive my passion. Um, with that being said, I was recruited by a, um, a man named Mr. Kerrigan in sixth grade. I'll always remember him. And he said, hey, he watched me, you know, doing a, a team building exercise. He said, I think you should try to get into REACH. I didn't know what REACH was. It was a program at the middle school for young students to kind of get involved and learn about networking and civic involvement and leadership development. Oh, wow. With that, I mean, we started raising money for Make-A-Wish. There was a group of 10 of us in this class. We raised $1,000 every year for Make-A-Wish. We did food drives. You know, we put in the cafeteria um, like a, a thermostat showing how close we were to our goal, and we colored in more and more every day. And the more you do it, the more involved you are, the more passionate you are. You know, we, we got to see the kids we helped through Make-A-Wish. They wrote to us. They sent photos. And once you kind of start helping and you start feeling like you're really making a difference because you are, it's just, it's hard to stop. You know, you just keep going. It's all about the passion. That's great. So as you got older, you got more involved in nonprofits, you even most recently started, you know, Let's Diabete This and, and kind of that whole fundraising aspect yourself. Um, what has that involvement done for you professionally as well? Yeah. So professionally, you know, I really, it all comes back, you know, delegating, communication, being able to work with groups of people, knowing when you can ask for help, knowing when to listen, and then when to speak up. You know, there have been times where I've had these ideas for my nonprofits and my friends have said, hey, well, what about this? Mm -hmm. And instead of dismissing the idea because, you know, I might think I have a better idea, you know, kind of diving into that and, and looking further. So, you know, that whole team aspect um, has been huge within work. Time management, um, mapping, which is huge. Uh, you know, we're doing that constantly. Is With every event that we're a part of, mm -hmm. we are mapping from the start to the end to make sure we don't miss a beat. Um, so... And when you say really, mapping, like project planning and that kind of thing? Yep, absolutely. Start right. to finish. Yeah. So I know that for me, as I think about some of the things that I did along the way, I was just, I was just doing them, right? Like you, you want to get involved. There's an opportunity. You're like, yes, I can help with that. Or, or that sounds exciting or, you know, doing a big fundraising campaign. Um, but looking back, seeing where I am now, looking back at my career during those times, I've definitely seen more than, than what I thought I was getting in, in the moment, right? Like 
I can see now that then later I went into a job interview or something else and, and they asked for an example and I was like, actually, I, I can think of some things that weren't job related. Did you have any moments like that for yourself along the way, either um, through an interview or just like looking back and thinking, man, I really got this new skill while I was doing this. I did not see that coming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, most of my jobs in sales haven't been event planning. They have not been really, I mean, sales is networking, but a lot of sales is destination. It's people coming to where you work because they want your product. Um, so then having um, people or I apologize, so having, um, you know, all these moments where I am networking, I am doing event planning, I am looking at every minor detail, I mean, that's huge for my role today. I remember, you know, I, over the last 18 months, um, I worked in a couple places and none of them really fit well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the downside of that is what that looks like on your resume. But, you know, my, my now boss, um, she sat me down, we had an interview and she brought up my resume. And the thing was, is she kind of saw a little bit of everything I was doing at each place, including my nonprofit and mm -hmm. all my volunteer work and said, you know what, I have to meet this girl, I've got to sit down and talk to her. And now I'm in the perfect fit role that really encompasses, encompasses all these skills that I've acquired through the nonprofits, through volunteering and, and all of that. That's awesome. I love that. Um, we've had a couple of um, questions come in. Um, one of them specifically around your work with JMG um, and the question um, being, what was your role with JMG and how um, are you able to help, J are you currently involved and are you currently working with um, JMG students? Yeah, so, you know, this funny and, story. Sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt one thing. Maybe not everybody on the call, call knows what JMG is. So that's Jobs for Mean Graduates. Um, and so maybe you can just share really briefly what that is a little bit as well. Just, I don't know everybody knows what it is, so. Yeah, so most schools have a class called Real Life or Senior Seminar. Um, and those are pretty typical to be in every high school, but uh, could be more now. Last year there was 73 schools with a JMG project within their school, which is one teacher. Um, they talk about career development, civic involvement, um, leadership development. They really help to, you know, whether you're learning about how to apply for college, how to write your college essay, how to interview, you know, the team building. It, it's all of these things that are going to prep you for real world situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I started, I mentioned REACH in middle school. Um, it was Project REACH. It was the stepping stone into JMG once you're in high school. So I started in sixth grade and by my senior year I was the president of JMG in my class. We every year would go to a career development conference. Um, typically it's juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. um, I went my junior year, I went my senior year and career development conferences, 600 to 700 students from across Maine. Wow. They recently just started working with Massachusetts students and they compete for scholarships. Um, they compete for just first, second, or third place in different things like public speaking or marketplace development or something called Pitch It where they say, hey, create an app and then you have 30 minutes with your three people that you're a team with to create an mm -hmm. app and then go out and pitch it to them. So. I did all of that with JMG. Um, I got a lot of my experience from JMG. I learned uh, about the mute fairy. Seventh grade, one of my teachers said, you're not allowed to talk anymore. Listen to what everybody else has to say. I think to this day, that's been one of my biggest learning moments mm -hmm. um, because it really helped with active listening. And that's huge. But um, I do still work with JMG. I go back every year to the career development conference um, I actually networked, met a board member. That's how I got my job at IDEX. Um, so it was kind of cool to see that all come full circle from the volunteering to giving back and then getting a career. Do you have to be formally involved with JMG to get involved? So thinking about these students who are on the call as they work towards graduation, um, either while they're in school or um, after they graduate, if that sounds like something they might want to get involved in and in helping to like mentor students 
uh, how would they go about doing that? Is that is that an option? Yeah, so honestly, if, if you are somebody who wants to get involved with JMG, you're helping anybody from, like I said, middle school to high school students, JMG most recently got into the colleges, so depending on what college you're at or graduated from, you can find out who the JMG specialist is at that college. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even look back at your high school and say, hey, who's, who's the JMG specialist? Can I get their contact info? And just reach out or reach out to me and I can connect you um, with you know, a, a few different people who can tell you about different events, put you on the list so that they're always reaching out to you because you don't have to be um, a previous JMG student to stay involved. That's great. Thank you. Um, I know that my intern, Elson, is listening into this. Elson, if you uh, have the opportunity during this um, call to uh, maybe get um, Julia's LinkedIn um, profile link and put that into the chat for folks who want to connect with Julia, that would be really helpful. I'll make that ask of her from, from yeah, afar. Thank, thank you, Allison, in advance. Um, so uh, another question for you, talking about kind of leadership, which we're really bringing all of this together um, under the, the umbrella of leadership. Do you see yourself as a leader? And did you always see yourself as a leader? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I've always said I have, you know, the leadership style of a coach. Mm -hmm. I'm always inspiring my friends, you know, whether I'm directly, you know, related or directly involved with their work, whatever it is, you know, friends have always come to me, they've come to me for help. Um, I was always the one getting our groups of friends together or, you know, doing a camper tri camping trip or senior skip day, mm -hmm. you know, kind of saying, okay, guys, come on, let's go. Um, I just, you know, again, networking has always come naturally to me. So anytime I can get people together or get a good camaraderie, get people excited to do something, I've always wanted to do it. Um, so leadership, it, it's always been there for me. I've, it's, I can't think of a time where somebody didn't say, you know, you're, you're a great leader. You should go into communications. Yeah. You should go into helping people, whatever that was. So I love some of the examples that you just gave because I think that sometimes as we move into early career and you're graduating, um, you start to think of leaders as more of people leaders, um, business leaders, like, well, I'm not a leader in my organization because I'm not the president or I don't have people working for me or, you know, I'm not a supervisor of this department. Um, and you start to, I, I really think, start to change what you think a leader is because you start saying, oh, that's the leader of my organization. Um, how has the like term leader been shaped for you and kind of what advice would you give to interns as they're figuring out their own leadership style and how to think about that? Absolutely. So, you know, I wrote down some notes to myself and as I look to my right, the one thing I have in bold is you don't have to be a boss a manager or a team lead to be a leader. Leadership is something that's going to come natural to you. You know, your boss might say, here's what I need to get done to you and four people. And if you're the one that says, okay, guys, let's do it this way. What do you think? You know, how can we make this move faster? You know, you do this, I'll do this. Would you like to do this? Um, you really, you don't have to be a boss or a manager to be a leader. And one of the biggest things I learned um, through the years is, you know, there's a fine line between a boss and a leader, and not every boss is a leader. Um, so as you're getting into your new roles and you are working with all these new people, you know, keep in mind, not everybody is going to have that inspirational leadership piece for you. Some people are going to be your boss, and they're going to say, this is what I need, this is what needs to get done, and this is what I need to buy. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going to happen. You know, we're, we've all had bosses like that. We're all going to continue to have bosses like that. So really understanding that from the beginning, you know, what that person's style is. Maybe it is to inspire you and to help you and to coach you. But again, maybe it's to say, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. And if you can visualize that and understand what your boss is needing from you, you're going to thrive, whether, you know, they're really showing a, a leadership role or not. And between that, with every single different person you work with, boss, leader, 
coworker, whatever it is, you're going to learn your own leadership skills. You're going to develop your own style. Um, you know, I before this interview, I looked up on Google leadership styles, and I started reading them, and I kind of said to myself, you know, everybody has their own style. You can't really pinpoint what that is. And as long as you can be there for people, help to inspire them, work with them, work to, you know, finish the project, just be excited to be there and be with these people, you are going to be a leader. Whether you notice it or not, people will notice you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, sorry, just lost my train <laughs> of thought. Um, so thinking about all of that work that you've done and I, and in all the kind of the nonprofit piece, as you think about kind of leadership, I know that there's been times where I, and it sounds like maybe you had a different experience and, and you've always kind of stepped up. I know that I felt like sometimes, you know, in my, in my professional career job, I took more of a back seat um, and then really found that when I was in the nonprofit or when I was volunteering, I was much more able to say, like raise my hand and say like, oh, I'll do that. Oh, I'll, I'll volunteer for this. Oh, I could do that because I just felt more comfortable where in, yeah. in my, in, you know, first couple of years out of college, uh, you know, in my first jobs, I had more of that hesitation. Like, I don't, I'm not the one who knows I'm still here to learn. I'm too early in my career. Um, to know that someone else should really take lead on it. Um, and I found it easier in that other space. Did you, did you feel that at all? Have you found that or experienced it in other ways? So I kind of experienced the opposite. Um, you know, like I mentioned, when I was younger, I, I got the mute fairy. We, we'd be in groups, we'd be doing discussions, we'd be brainstorming, and I would kind of just go. And there was no stopping me. So to get that mute fairy really said, hey, you need to listen to what others have to offer. You need to take that seat back. Um, and, you know, that, that's been huge. To be able to, I've had some jobs where I've wanted to do more, but was told I couldn't. You know, we're corporate. We can't have you doing this extra stuff. Um, so, again, where I kind of found the opposite, it kind of helped me to, to take a step back and that's where I'm, you know, able to help, ask for help. I'm able to delegate more. I'm better at listening to everybody's ideas. Um, so although we were, we were opposites, it was still kind of that learning curve of, okay, take a step back. You know, you don't need to handle six things at once. You can mm -hmm. do these three, and you've got a team of people who can help with the other three. Um, so little, little opposite. Um, but still a big learning curve to be able to take that seat back and, uh, you know, work with others that much more. Great. Thank you. So we've had a couple of questions come in about starting your own nonprofit. So I want to spend a little bit of time there. Um, we had someone ask, is it difficult to start a nonprofit? And then um, Emily asked, what challenges have you faced um, at your nonprofit? How did you overcome them? Um, and what advice can you offer to someone who might want to start their own nonprofit? Yeah, so depending on your background with nonprofits, it, it might be difficult. Um, for me, being somebody who liked getting people together and kind of just said, you know, for my cornhole tournament, I need people to sign up, I need raffle, I need items to raffle off, um, and then I need somebody to help me with a bracket. That's really where I started. I kept it as simple as possible. And then as those things came together, I just started adding in smaller details. Um, one of them being, you know, like best team name wins a prize. You know, gets people more excited. It's, it's the little details. So although it wasn't difficult for me to start it, um, it's just about paying attention to all those fine details to make it come together smoothly. Um, and with the challenges, I think the biggest challenge for me was getting the 501c3, um, the, the tax identification number, I didn't have anybody to go to. I'm Looking back, I had a lot of people I could have probably went to, um, but I really wanted to make it happen. So I you know, found a company, I chatted with them, they helped me figure out what I needed to do to get the 501c3. 
Um, they told me about the cost associated with it. That was great. Once I got the 501c3, the tax identification number, I was able to get sponsors. I was able to get bigger raffle items because now I'm a legitimate nonprofit and people can you know, write it off on their taxes and so they're able to give bigger donations. Um, one thing that was super difficult w was the taxes. Once tax season came around, I reached back out to that company that helped me get started to say, hey, I'm new at this. What do I need to do? What can you send me? How can you help? And just use it as a learning curve. Again, you know, just knowing, hey, I have people I can turn to to ask for help. Um, so for overcoming those challenges, really just, just seek out help. Every, somebody's going to help you. They're going to want to help you. And you're going to learn in that moment. Um, That's great. So uh, thinking about that too, right, with um, reaching out, who are we, you know, who could, if a student was thinking, that, okay, that's what I need to do next. I need to get, you know, get myself to be a, um, a nonprofit in that designation, you know, is that as easy as Googling? Should they be going to specific organizations or doing it, suggestions? I think it depends really on, I mean, I don't know so much about other states or anything like that, but I know if you have somebody who's been doing a nonprofit, you know, ask them what they've been doing. If, if you guys wanted to reach back out to me and say, hey, who's the organization you use to help you learn all about the 501c3 side and the taxes, you know, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, where I, I'm always still learning, um, I'd feel more confident in helping you make that connection um, to somebody that knows all the ins and outs and can answer every single question you have in detail and feel confident you're getting the newest, um, most pertinent information to move forward. So. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, Rebecca is, has asked the question, um, how do you incorporate giving back into your daily life? Um, is finding a balance between working hard at your job and your passion beyond that difficult. Um, I, I know that for me, if it's, I've gone through peaks and valleys on that. And, and I think one of the hardest things that I've found is reconciling that for myself and just knowing um, when I need to be okay with taking a little time off, right? Like when I can put in all the effort or knowing that as an example of this summer, the work that I do with uh, my Rotary Club is going to kind of be on pause. Like I can say that the PR that we've done this summer is not up to the snuff that it was earlier this year because I'm doing all of this work for, for the internship program and, and just kind of having to reconcile that. Um, but how, how has it worked for you and, and what has your experience been? So for me, um, you know, luckily right now my cornhole tournament is one day a year. I've got a full year to start prepping. Um, I stay organized. I have, you know, tote boxes with everything I need for every year, from tape to pens to raffle tickets. Just making sure I stay organized is number one. Um, number two is I'm on a couple different boards. I recently was just on the American Cancer Society board for a masquerade ball that we were working on. Now, the great thing about that is that's once a year, but it's in April. My cornhole tournament is in October. Knowing that, you know, the beginning of the year I have one thing and the end of the year I have another to focus on really helps that balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being on the board of Propel, that's once a month. And then being on the board of Propel, my um, role is to work with the nonprofits and to host events at beer breweries to showcase that nonprofit. Um, so I think what I do for that. This year's a little bit different, but typically we do three events a year. So again, those are really spread out. Um, so as long as I can say, hey, you know, here's a view of my year. Mm -hmm. Once I'm done the American Cancer Society, I'm going to start focusing on this. Once this is done, I'm going to focus even more on the cornhole tournament. But again, throughout the year, I'm doing small things to check off the list as I have time. Um, I also do, you know, private fundraising. I worked with this fantastic family. I just happen to meet. Um, this great woman on at, at an event, 
and she said, listen, my brother has lung cancer, I'm a police officer, I cannot solicit any money. And I said, well, let me help you. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, we had about four months planned out of fundraising. So that there, I did take on a little bit more than I could handle, although I handled it fine, but it did take away from a lot of my, you know, personal time spent with family, my boyfriend, my friends. But again, it's something I'm passionate about, and they understood that. And I invited them to these events to come mm -hmm. see, you know, what I've been working on. Um, <clears throat> but the big thing really is just organizing your time. You know, and, and like you said, right now you're working on Focus Maine and the internships. So, you know, something else is going to take a little bit of a back seat for that. And then once you're done this, you'll be able to kind of turn back and say, okay, let's go full throttle again. Here we go. Great. Um, so another question kind of following in some of the things that we've been talking about um, and kind of what it takes to start the nonprofit and kind of get things going what do you wish you knew before you started yours? Or what do you wish you knew at the beginning that you, that you know now? One thing I wish I knew, the first year I kind of did everything by myself. I thought it was going to be a breeze and I had to recruit my mom to sell raffle tickets. I had to recruit a friend to stop what they were doing and do 50-50. Um, you know, I had to run around finding these people um, to tell them their team is up and they're playing against this team um, really turned into quite a mess because although I knew a lot of the people, I had no idea what their team name was, so I had no idea who I was going to find. Um, so, you know, over the, over, you know, a couple trips and falls, if you will, I started doing big brackets. You know, I actually stopped the team names. I got a microphone. Um, <laughs> little things that you really just don't know until you start and as you come across it don't be fearful of what you don't know once you get there you're gonna cross the bridge and you're gonna learn from it. it's all about you know it's their learning curve it's all an experience it's gonna help you move forward and I think the biggest thing was for me with the Cornhole tournament the first year I had a lot of feedback and I listened to that I dove into it and I saw what I could change what I might not have too much control of, but how could I make it better? Um, and that was that was huge, just to be able to, to go back and look at the mistakes. You have to make mistakes to get better or you don't know what you need to get better at. Right. So for students who are thinking about um, kind of doing all, all of this, right? Like whether they're thinking about starting a nonprofit or that's kind of just too overwhelming, but they, they're hearing what we're saying and they want to get involved. Um, yep. and kind of start to grow and start to their career, what advice would you give to students who are now interested in going out and growing themselves through nonprofit work? Like what, what yeah. do you think they should, should look for? You know, what advice do you have? Absolutely. So not every nonprofit is going to be for you. Um, you know, I, clean, I deep cleaned a soup kitchen once, and although it felt so good when we were done to know that these people had the best establishment um, and it was cleanly as it could be, I probably wouldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I found other things that I'm passionate about. Um, you know, anything with cancer research, diabetes research, um, Childhood cancer is big for me. I lost a friend to childhood cancer, so I'm donating to St. Jude, although a small amount, $8 every month. I've got this great calendar, and I get a photo of a kid I helped to put on for every month. Um, but really, you know, ask yourself, what are you passionate about? What, what stories on Facebook do you read, and you, it hits you? You know, look it up. See how, what organizations you might be able to get involved in. Um, you know, when you're out in the workforce, see if your work offers a volunteered time off. Um, that, that's pretty big. I worked for one company, they gave us 16 hours, so two full days of paid time off, specifically meant for volunteering. Um, even now, I'll take my own PTO just to go volunteer. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I'm young right now, so I need to make sure those paychecks are still coming in. But at the same time, I want to get out and I want to volunteer. So using a PTO day for me is, is just as good as going out on the weekend. Um, also invite your family, invite your friends, 
bond with them, you're going to find an even better experience when you're working with people you know. And, you know, bringing somebody you know might help you kind of get over that, that awkward moment of, okay, I'm starting something new. And yeah. then you might start to go by yourself, and then you're networking. And then this person says, hey, well, I also volunteer here. And next thing you know, you and this new person are going around, and you're meeting all these people, and now you're volunteering, you know, a couple times a month, and you don't even know where it came from. That's great. That's great advice. Um, as you were talking, I, I also, you know, think that I've, I've, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of heard from you throughout this conversation, um, even as you, you know, other people have approached you to help with something or you find a new nonprofit, you kind of keep coming back to fundraising and organizing. Um, and it sounds like that's just kind of where you fit in naturally. Um, I, I think that I've found some of that same kind of thing where there's, there's, uh, nonprofits or organizations that I feel passionately about, but the volunteer opportunities that they have aren't the right ones for me in that moment and how yeah. I want to be involved. Um, I, I think that that's fine. Um, students are going to, are, are going to be able to, anybody can go out and find things that they feel passionately about, you know, um, events or organizations that they feel passionately about. The mission is right, but the volunteer opportunity isn't right. And I think, you know, it's good to kind of hear your experiences too, to help drive that conversation that says, you have to find the right fit everywhere to make it work for you. Do you agree? Yeah, no, I definitely do. You know, although deep cleaning a soup kitchen wasn't for me, maybe I networked with somebody and they're saying, hey, we've got a food drive coming up. And I'm like, perfect. Count me in. How can I help? Let's do it. So you might volunteer for something and not love it, but, you know, reach out to somebody and say, how mm -hmm. else can I help? This, this wasn't my, my forte. These are some of my skills. Where, where can they be utilized? And, um, you know, you'd be surprised with what people come back with. Nonprofits, they're, they're always looking for help. They're always looking for volunteers. They need more than you realize until you ask. Um, you know, my boss and I were talking about this earlier, too. Nonprofits fill a huge gap from, you know, what government and everything just can't do. And it's such a large gap. You know, America relies on that. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of the research, just everything going on, most of it is because of nonprofits and volunteers, whether you're volunteering an hour a month or, you know, a month a year. It, it doesn't matter. Just get out there, do what you can, get involved, and you'd be surprised at, again, how good it feels, and next thing you know, you're volunteering for four or five, maybe six different uh, organizations. Sure, sure. And um, I, I love what you said earlier about, um, you know, whether or not your uh, company maybe offers um, a benefit of having time off. I know there's a lot of companies going that direction and saying, we'll give you more days off if this is what you're going to use them for, for giving back in the community, which is great. So definitely something you can be asking. And if it's important to you, a really thoughtful question that you can ask in an interview as well that helps show the employer who you are and what's important to you. Um, I know too, there's, there's lots of organizations who have connections to nonprofits. I don't know if is as Evergreen one of those, do you guys work with some nonprofits? Yeah, we work with the American, or sorry, the Animal Refuge League. We work with Portland Trails. Um, there's a few others we work with, but you know, an example of the Animal Refuge League is we donated gift cards, $50 gift cards. So every Friday, $5 Friday at the, at the Refuge League, if you donate $5, you're entered in to win the $50 gift card. Um, so little things like that, but we're always giving back. We're always looking at nonprofits we can be involved in. Um, so it, it's really nice. You know, I know we have, um, with COVID, a lot of our company, you know, get-togethers have been mm -hmm. canceled, but I know that at one point they're looking at, you know, cleaning the Portland trails or getting a group of us together to go back to that nonprofit we work with and then get together as a team and work together to help clean it up. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that that's another great thing for 
people to think about as they're, you know, organizing themselves or after graduation, getting into a company. You know, sometimes it's easy to find your way through those things um, just by saying, okay, well, who is my organization already involved in? And I'm going to have a foot in the door through that. Um, there's probably someone here who can make an introduction for me to help understand what, what might be needed. Um, and as you're, as you're growing, as you know, you said you were on a number of boards. I've been on a few boards. It's a great way to learn a ton of different things um, about managing and leading organizations. Um, and nonprofits are always looking for more board members. Um, women are notoriously left off of boards. Um, people of color are notorious le notoriously left off of boards in America. Um, and it's something that in today's world, um, many boards are looking to do um, and expand in that way. So even as a young professional, even in college, you know, I, I certainly would encourage everyone, if there's a nonprofit that you're interested in, look at ways to get involved in and see if they're looking for board members, if there's a way that you could help support it. Yep. And um, I just, I saw Dexter uh, reached out and asked about, you know, if I wanted to continue to grow my nonprofits or if I wanted to keep them relatively small. Um, you know, it just brings us back to the conversation earlier of time management and what I have mm -hmm. time for. Um, you know, you have to have that, that work-life balance. And for me, my volunteer work is my work. It, it's something I'm passionate about. It's still my working hours. Um, you know, I, I mentioned I'd love to do a skydiving event. Um, sometime in August, you know, if I can get 10 people to raise $500 each, by the end of the day, we're gonna have $3,000 to donate to um, another nonprofit of our choice or to keep it with my Let's Diabetes mm -hmm. and donate it to the American Diabetes Association. I found that that is a much larger, there's, a, there's more planning involved with an event like that. So I've kind of put that on the back burner. I'm going to stick with my cornhole tournament for now. As my time starts to free up, as I feel like I'm that much more confident in mm -hmm. getting things done, making sure again I have that time, then I'll start to, you know, make it bigger. But you know, it, it, it just might not happen, and that's totally fine. I'm doing just once a year is enough. You know, we, we bring in a few thousand dollars, and that, that alone is a great feeling. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't get bigger, that's okay. If it does, you know, that's great. Um, but one way the, or the other, I'm, I'm not too focused on what's going to happen as long as it keeps going. Great. Thank you. So it's a little bit off topic, but we're, we have a couple of minutes left and um, just give people a last chance to, to ask any questions into the, the Q&A. As you and I were talking earlier um, today, you um, told a story which I thought was extremely relevant to our interns. Um, at one point earlier in your career, you worked for a staffing company um, and yep. you, to, you were talking, we, we were, for those of you people listening, we were talking about interviewing and, and being comfortable in interviews and how to be interviewed and that really I was just interviewing you today in this conversation and and you shared an experience that you had with um, a young woman who you were interviewing for a position and I thought it was extremely relevant for for these folks to hear about how interactions can change and the perceptions that people can have of you um, as you're interviewing, um, if you really just share who you are. So would you mind kind of sharing that story again? Absolutely. So at this staffing company, I had one opening at um, a local company in South Portland. We were only allowed to submit three, um, three people at a time. You know, we didn't want to overwhelm their HR when they decided who they wanted to interview, anything like that. I had already submitted my three on this day, and this young girl came in for an interview. She was so nervous. I felt terrible. And to be the one interviewing her, you know, you guys, you guys can see me now. I'm, I'm down to earth. I'm happy to talk to you. Um, I'm upbeat. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll try to inspire you if I can, whatever it is. So once she sat down, I kind of said, whoa, hey, this is just you and I. I you know, this is an interview. but..." 
I'm getting to know you so I can find the best fit place for you. And, and you know, I let her know I'm not, I'm not judging you in any way. I'm really here to just learn about you. So I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, take a, take a minute, relax, and let's just chat. That's what an interview is. You're chatting. It's a conversation. Um, and she ended up relaxing enough. I got to learn she has a great personality. She wants to help people. And although I submitted three people for this role already, I knew the HR lady would love her because I truly got to know her. Mm -hmm. And it was only a half hour we spent together, but she really let her guard down and just had that one-on-one conversation. She let the nerves go, and because of that, I was able to see the real her and place her somewhere. So I sent her off, my fourth person that I wasn't supposed to do, and HR came back and said, I only want to interview her. And she got the job. You know, we talked before she went to the interview. I said, listen, I've talked to this HR director quite a bit. She's just like me. She wants to, you know, find the best fit. She's upbeat. She, you know, you're going to get along with her great. Just be yourself. Let the nerves go. Have a conversation with her. So, again, she got the job. Within, I think, six or seven months, although I was no longer at the company, I had her on LinkedIn, and she reached out to me. She said, Julia, I got hired full-time, or I got hired permanently, Mm -hmm. and it's the best job I've ever had. You know, she left working two jobs, one of them being Dunkin' Donuts, to getting her foot in the door at a corporate company, all because she could say, okay, I'm going to go have a conversation with this person and let my guards down and be myself. And she, she did it, you know, just being herself. She made it happen. Now she's in a career, and she's set up for life. That's awesome. Thank you again for sharing that story. I just, that would be a good way to end as, as all of these students are headed out into more interviews, whether it's for full-time positions or internships. Um, it's so important to just remember it's a conversation and everyone that you're meeting with uh, is just another person to have a conversation with and learn. So thank you so much. We're coming up on, on time um, and really appreciate the conversation that we had today. Um, and thank everybody who was listening on the call this afternoon. Um, we hope that you learned a little bit about us and also about yourself and what might help drive you and your career in the future. Um, but thank you, Julia, for sharing so much about yourself and your own journey. Thanks for having me. This is great. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to hit close on this um, webinar today. And I thank everybody who is listening um, on the call and have a great day. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.